Yeah. Today, the single greatest adventure that I've ever been on is not an adventure bike. It's that adventure of trusting God. I am not the same as these cats. I still in their beeswax. I don't ever cap, but I'm wearing like three hats. Never been a rat, but I know where the cheese at. In the same way, if we all remember back to when we were at school, if our parents or guardians or grandparents were going to pick us up from school and they were five minutes late, the majority of us would have just said they're late and we would have waited. That's actually faith. When we were in kindergarten, there might have actually been zero faith and we may have been desperately scared that they were never coming to pick us up. Faith grows over time through that relationship and actually through seeing trustworthiness. So in this episode, I'd like to share with you the greatest adventure that I was privileged to that happened to happen on the walk around the world, but it was the moment that helped solidify my faith. We've been on quite an adventure today, but as I was saying earlier on, the biggest adventure that I've had is that learning to trust God, the adventure with God. When I arrived in Wyoming in the United States of America, it was about minus 22 degrees Celsius from memory when I walked into a small town called Medicine Bow, which was in the Rocky Mountains. Now, here's the problem, at minus 22 degrees Celsius, my water supply, my two Camelback water systems had frozen rock solid and that day was just an 18 kilometre day between two towns, Rock River and Medicine Bow. From there though it was very daunting because from Medicine Bow the next town was a small city called Casper and it was 148 kilometres away. This is the first major snowfall for Wyoming. I had a small snowfall a week or two ago, but this is the first big one. And my map said there was nothing in between. It was a wilderness area called Shirley Basin. It's not the sort of place you want to get stuck. In fact, I walked into the only two businesses in Medicine Bow, the service station and the pub, opened my map and I was asking the locals, what's out there? Where can I mark in on the map? Any service stations, any shops, any hotels, that was wishful thinking. Anything out there that's going to help me and I can plan my way across that 148 k's. But the locals were just shaking their heads at me and saying, no, there's nothing out there. It's just wilderness. And one guy piped up and said, in fact, a few weeks ago, we lost someone out there, one of our locals. Her car broke down and it took half an hour for someone to get to her. And by the time they arrived, by the time help arrived to her, she had died along with her two children. Because they couldn't start the engine, there was no heat coming into the car and they perished. They died in that cold at minus 22 or on that day about minus 30. Now I've got three days to do the crossing so this is a third of the way at the moment and it's currently 5pm. Sun will go down about an hour and a half so I might try and find somewhere to put my tent up. And all the locals were telling me not to do it. 
they're saying, don't risk it. In fact, one cowboy said to me, don't be stupid, protect the mission, get the bus. They said there is a bus that goes around Shirley Basin. It's about a 300 kilometre trip on the bus, it'll get you there safely. Protect the mission. In the end, they convinced me that yes, it would be a stupid idea to try and walk across Shirley Basin in the middle of winter. The mission wasn't about walking. The walking was merely a means to bring the mission to people. I walked into the pub, sat down with my counter meal, and as I ate my dinner, I was praying. But funnily enough, I wasn't praying anything. I was silent. And in that silence, it felt as though God was prompting me to trust Him. As in, trust me with this. And I'd been through so much to get to that moment. And if I look back through the journey, there were plenty of other occasions where I had felt that inner voice of God saying, trust me, and I hadn't. That silent whisper, trust me, and I didn't. I, I ended up choosing what I felt was needed in the moment, what was responsible. And on many occasions, I then later found out what I missed out on. And it culminated in this moment in Shirley Basin or in Medicine Bow on the edge of Shirley Basin. I simply prayed, okay, God, I'll do it. But if I die out there, it's your fault. There's a lot of antelope battle around here. Uh, a lot of uh, white-tailed deer as well. It's supposed to be uh, elk, moose up around here somewhere, as well as bison. But I uh, haven't seen anything like that yet. But I'm about, about 30 kilometres down of 148 until the next store, until the next civilization. Uh, we're going okay. It's good. 148 kilometres ahead of me. It was around minus, uh, around minus 28, I think, that morning as I set off. Here's the big problem. To cover that distance, it would require three days of solid walking. I set off on that first morning into a ferociously strong northerly wind, the cold wind coming in from the Arctic. But over those three days, pretty much everything that could go wrong did go wrong. My water supply froze rock solid on that first day. My food supply ran out halfway through that second day. On that second day, well actually on the first night, it was so incredibly cold that by about 2 or 3 a.m. I'd woken up shivering in my one-man tent but sleeping inside a sleeping bag, inside what they call a thermal sock, and all of that inside a survival bag, and woke up shivering and wheezing really badly. Well, it's a bit past four in the morning and the, the temperature has dropped way below zero and it's, uh, it's excruciatingly cold to the point where I'm going to have some breakfast and hit the road again. The camera is struggling because the lens is fogging up because of the, uh, the temperature. Now the outside of my tent is iced over, I can hear it crackling away. So it's going to be difficult to pack it up, but I can't, uh, I can't sleep anymore. So I hit the road and uh, probably be 4.30 once I'm on the road, trying to get some warmth back. Above my head on the tent were icicles. My breath had been escaping from all that gear, hitting the tent fabric in one spot above my tent. Well, I've uh, just got my tent up, but uh, it started to rain, so I've only got my gear in. I haven't actually set my tent up. <laughs> it's pretty bare at the moment. Uh, so I'm just gonna sit here and eat a sandwich and uh, then if the rain stops, I'll be able to get back outside and uh, get the rest of the, the gear. I'll just do it from here, I guess. I hit them off the tent, packed the gear up and walked on, power walking, trying to get warmth back into my body. After 20 kilometres, the sun had risen, but I was now so severely dehydrated 
that my saliva glands had shut down. My toe split for the second time out in Shirley Basin. The first time was back in Panama. On this occasion, it split so badly that as I walked down the road, I could audibly hear my left foot squelch in the boot. The boot was filling with blood. And yet every time something bad happened out in Shirley Basin, a random Christian cowboy rocked up, not knowing that I was out there and happened to be carrying exactly what I needed. The first guy rocked up at about 11 a.m. on the second day. His name was Gary. Gary rocked up in his big American pickup, his big red ute, and happened to be carrying a nice big bottle of Gatorade with him, which he threw out the window to me. And he said to me, I bought this before I left home this morning. But as I took off, he said, I thought, gee whiz, that's stupid. I hate Gatorade. He said, I don't even like this stuff. I don't know why I bought it. He said, do you need it? I said, yes, desperately. He said, here, have that. He threw some Snickers bars to me as well. We prayed for unity right there and then out in the middle of Shirley Basin and then parted company. I walked on into that second day at last rehydrated, but still struggling with my breathing a little bit. Felt lethargic, obviously had either pneumonia or possibly even a bit of hypothermia. But at the end of the second day, I arrived at the 102 kilometre mark. I had a nice flat spot to put my tent down. Got into my tent in darkness. In the distance, what sounded like either wolves or coyotes. I can't tell the difference. Wild canines in the distance howling. I'm in my tent, I've got no food left. I finished the Gatorade, no water. And I'm sitting in my tent thinking, how do I get out of this alive? Like, how am I supposed to go to sleep tonight on an empty stomach? Let alone get up tomorrow morning and walk another, what was it, another 46 kilometers from there. I heard footsteps approaching my tent. Not what you want to hear in the middle of nowhere. I lunged at my tent door and I'll be honest, I was scared it was going to be a wolf or a bear or something like that, maybe a rogue cow. But I unzipped my tent, shone my torch out and emerging out of the darkness towards me was Jet, J-H-E-T-T, -T. Jet the Christian Cowboy, swaggering his way towards my tent with both arms laden full of food. He knelt down beside my tent and said, I just thought you might be hungry, son. It was enough food for me to have a nice hot dinner. Welcome back to my palace, my tent. I've put my tent up at a, uh, at a horse farm. This um, right beside me here is a big shed. And in that shed is uh, an enormous expanse where they have rodeos. One of the young guys, Jet, he's, he's literally one of the cowboys, Jet. He just went home and brought me back some fruit, a bag of fruit and some jerky and some scones, some cake that his wife had just made. So, uh, very lovely to be here. It was good too. Look, I was running, I was running pretty low on food. Uh, I had three days for this crossing. This is the end of day two and it was pretty hard pressed to, to make it through to tomorrow to get into Casper without uh, running out of food. I, I had another meal at 2.30 a.m. in the morning. I woke up hungry, ate that, breakfast, a light lunch, and walk on into Casper at four o'clock in the afternoon on the third day. Slightly hungry and wheezing a little bit, but alive. I'm on the road again from Casper. Um, I'm not really not feeling well. The chest infection is still with me. Just finding it. I'm a little bit short of breath and uh, lethargic. I've basically been wanting to go back to bed since about 11 a.m. It's now 4 p.m and I don't have a hotel to stay in tonight or anything like that. I'm walking out in the middle of nowhere, so it'll be a tent job again. Oh, I'm tired. Now, when I walked into Casper, the very first thing I could see was the Super 8 Motel. I was in love with that hotel. I was desperate to stop walking. I felt very lethargic, very tired. I just wanted to go to sleep. I wanted a hot shower, a hot meal and a bed, and I didn't care what order. And yet, as I approached the Super 8 Motel, 
It was as though God overrode my thoughts. Call it an attack of conscience, if you'd like. It suddenly felt as though God said, Sam, you didn't come here to go to hotels. You came here to go to churches. Do the mission. I was so angry that either I'd thought this and was now contemplating it, or God had prompted that in within, or God had prompted that within me. Whatever the case was, I was grappling with what my decision was going to be. And it wasn't until I got in front of that hotel that I gave up on it and just said, okay, God, whatever. I don't care right now. I'll go to the churches and genuinely reluctantly walked on past hotel after hotel and past locked church after locked church. I met a cleaner at one and that was it. An hour later, I'd only covered three kilometres. I was in a lot of pain. My foot was squelching in blood. I prayed another quick prayer and I said, God, this is stupid. No one is in these churches. I'm hurting, you know that. I'm done, I'm getting a hotel, but I'll find one more church. If there is no one in that church, that's your problem. I'm getting a hotel. The final church I walked up to was Our Lady of Fatima Catholic Church. It was only hundred metres down the road. I hadn't seen it when I prayed the prayer. I walked up to the presbytery, knocked on the door, and a large priest opened up with a big beard. His name was Father Robert Fox. I introduced myself to Father Fox. I told him what the mission was, because he took me out in the other direction to the Five Star Marriott Ski Resort and put me upstairs for two nights on his credit card so that I could have a rest the next day and get my lungs and toes seen to at the hospital. But the next morning I walked out into a press conference because Father Fox had gone home, rung the state newspapers, television crews and radio stations, plus the local pizza guy. He had pizza set up on the side for everyone. Father Fox was helping himself to pizza for breakfast. The rest of us got stuck into the press conference. But partway through the press conference, one of the reporters asked a very dismissive question. He said, why are you putting your life on the line for unity? Why not walk for something worthwhile? Before I'd said a single word to answer his question, Father Fox off to the side had thrown his pizza back into the box, walked in front of the cameras and drilled them on the scandal of disunity, not just on the church, but on society in general, to the point where the reporters stop reporting. They actually put their heads down, he pricked their conscience. In fact, some of them were apologising to Father Fox, it was like group confession. But then one reporter, not knowing who he was, as though snapping back into reality, stepped forward and said, sorry, who are you? You could see the other reporters looking at him as if to say, oh dude, don't do that. Father Fox just eyeballed this guy and said, I'm Father Robert Fox, Wyoming's delegate for unity, and then turned and winked at me. He wasn't, he hadn't even told me there was interest in what I was doing, let alone that this was his lifelong passion. Well, in Casper, Father Fox, he was uh, taking care of me um, incredibly, uh, put me up in a motel. Now, I've, I'm having my rest day today, we had an, an interview this morning with the local news, the TV news, and then with the newspaper. Um, but Father's just brought me up, up the mountain here for a view of Casper down out there. I look back on that journey across Shirley Basin and I realise now that had I taken the bus, had I done what I thought was responsible, it would have dropped me on the other side of Shirley Basin in Casper at the bus depot. And I now know that bus depot 
is one kilometre past Father Robert Fox. I would have taken the three-star hotel next door to the bus depot and walked on from there. I would never have met Father Fox. I would never have received the leg up for the mission where the invitation took off around the world, not just to the doors I was stopping at. If there's one thing I learnt from the walk around the world is that any time I felt that God asked me to trust, to trust Him, it hurt. They became the most satisfying moments of the entire journey. It hurts to trust God. And if I can be blunt and honest here for one moment, I don't think that walking around the world is the hardest place to trust God. Crossing Shirley Basin in the middle of winter through the Rocky Mountains, in a sadistic way, I enjoyed the challenge. I think the hardest place to trust God is with our relationships. We know what God is asking of us. The satisfaction that comes from placing our complete trust in God is immense. And our faith grows through seeing God's providence. All the best in your own journey, on your own great adventure, in growing in faith, through placing trust in God. Pretty cool to see a coyote out here. I've heard them for a long time while I've been sleeping, basically since I came across the United States border in Texas. But that's the first one I've seen, and I'm three quarters of the way across the United States at the moment. Um, they're a lot different to what I thought they'd look like. I always thought they'd be like uh, Coyote Wiley, the cartoon that's always chasing the roadrunner. You know, long, long-legged, slim, <laughs> slobbering, mangy-looking thing, but Quite a pretty animal. They um, look like basically like a small wolf. But uh, I guess I guess Bugs Bunny doesn't really look like a rabbit, and Taz Devil doesn't look like a Tasmanian devil either. So I should have known better. There is a line in the Catechism of the Catholic Church in the Article of Faith that says that our faith is not a blind impulse of the mind. That being that we shouldn't simply believe because someone said we should. Our faith grows because of an encounter. Gospel of Matthew, chapter 10. Jesus sends out the 12 disciples and he gives them instructions on what their mission is and what they are to do, but he also gives them instructions, not just on what the mission is, but how to go about that mission. Do not take along any gold or silver or copper in your belts. Basically, don't take any extra money in your pocket. And how often do we just want to do fundraising before we head out on mission? Take no, take no bag for the journey. I, I think most of us would do that. I did that. Or extra tunic, or sandals, or a staff. For the worker is worth his keep. Whatever town or village you enter, search for some worthy person there and stay at his house until you leave. As you enter the home, Give it your greeting. If the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. If it is not, let your peace return to you. The simplicity with which we enter into the mission for what God calls us to. Jesus invites us into mission to trust Him and to let Him do. To let, so God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, let them to actually do the mission. Holy Father, please bless us with the courage to be humble, to follow you, to trust you. Please help our faith, our little faith to grow. We pray this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
beginning. You can't always. This is the death. Remarkably him. Turn back. Towards God. Rise up. <laughs>